name is Danielle Varda, and I am the director of our Center on Network Science at the University of Colorado Denver in the School of Public Affairs. And it is um, my pleasure to welcome everyone today who's joining our webinar to our Network Leadership from the Field, Linking the Research to Practice webinar series. Um, today we have a fantastic webinar uh, titled A Network Approach to Fostering Empowerment, Leadership, and Innovation within Public Sector Agencies. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers from the National Park Services here in just a moment. Um, so just a couple of little housekeeping things. Uh, we always encourage folks to use a hashtag, a common hashtag when we talk about network leadership. It's um, hashtag network leaders. During the webinar, feel free to post your comments there um, or use that anytime that you're thinking about network leadership. Um, we'd like to give a little bit of an overview of what network leadership is. Um, the reason that we think about network leadership is that we know that many people today are working in networks. We call it the network way of working. But, you know, while we are all busy implementing our programs, we have trouble finding ways to get information and tools and build our skills around how to manage and think about constructing and evaluating those kinds of networks. So network leadership is, an, is a leadership framework that we've adopted where members of networks build skills to use data to make decisions, um, to uh, gain practices, and these um, members of, uh, who invo are involved in network leadership are not always the person running the, the network. We believe that anyone involved in a network needs to gain and learn network leadership skills. So towards that end, out of our Center in Network Science, out of the University of Colorado Denver School of Public Affairs, we host these workshops and webinars on, on network leadership. Um, and we just really do hope that it's a way to build community and bring some of the folks who have been a part of our trainings back into presenting positions, which is what's happening today. And I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, so a few ways to stay connected to our Center on Network Science. We just started a new Network Leadership Facebook group. So, you know, people are constantly asking us how to stay connected. And so we went ahead and um, started this Facebook group. Anybody can join, and we do encourage you to, um, to join. And it's an open group where anyone can post in the group, and it's a place to share information and knowledge. It's still growing. It's quite small. So, um, so feel free to log on to Facebook and, and ask to join that, and we'll get everyone in there. Again, the, the hashtag we use. Um, and then just a couple of things about this webinar. We know people have questions, so what we encourage everyone to do um, is use, if you, in the Zoom um, uh, framework there that you just opened up, the, the Zoom tool, you can pull it down um, either at the bottom or top of your screen, depending how your computer is set up, and there will be a box that says Q&A. So when you drag that down, uh, click on the Q&A box, and that will be where um, we have um, a place where you can put in your questions. And we will monitor those questions as we go through the webinar. And so at the end of the webinar, we'll do a Q&A session with the presenters answering that. If you have, sorry, if you have um, technical questions, then we do ask you to, um, put those in the chat box and um, someone will answer those like, you know, you're having trouble with your screen um, and so forth. I'm so sorry, I don't know what, why things are showing up there. Um, we are going to record the webinar and the recording and slides will be emailed at the end of this and available for you at any time. Um, and uh, just a few last things here. On uh, February 15th is our next webinar on leading networks towards action how to facilitate effective discussions with groups of diverse stakeholders. So that will be a presentation by Cap Wilkes from the National Rural Health Resource Center. So please join us for that. And our March webinar is just about to be um, scheduled. It will be a, a, a report back on um, the a, a network evaluation of the Million Hearts Network. Okay, and last thing, um, we do want to let everyone know that we do run an annual Network Leadership Training Academy. Uh, that training academy is um, where we met the folks who are presenting today and learned about the network going on at the National Park Service. We just opened registration and our early registration rates, which give a discount, are open until March 17th. Um, it's a place where people come for three days and work together on thinking about how to build, manage, and evaluate effective networks. Um, this year, we are really excited about our changes and our new speakers and the ways that we're doing things. So. Uh, if you're interested in that, please do 
um, join us for that. We had to shut down registration four weeks early last year because we got full. So it is something we expect to fill, and so uh, we do look forward to that um, this year. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and present our uh, introduce our two presenters today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Bianca Klein. She is an interpretive media specialist for Yellowstone National Park. Um, you can read much more about Bianca um, on her bio, um, but she's had quite an experience working um, with the National Park Service and has now recently become the interpretive media specialist at Yellowstone, where she works primarily in communication, creative media, and education. Um, she's the co-lead of the communications subcommittee of the National Park Service's Innovative Leadership Network, which is a network that we're going to learn about today. Um, so thank you, Bianca. We're excited to have you here. And her co-presenter um, is, is Dylan um, Morozik McDonald. Um, he's a ranger at Arcadia National Park, um, began working at Boston National Historic Park, is now a visitor resource protection park ranger. Um, you'll see that he has quite a background, including um, his recent law degree in environmental law and policy, and he serves as the net network secretary for the Innovative Leadership Network. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to him now, but we welcome both of you. And this is a really great um, webinar for us. It, it is an area that I think lots of people are interested in because we're all curious what the national parks are doing in networks. So thank you both for joining today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the screen share over um, to Dylan at this point. Thanks so much. Hello and good morning or afternoon. This is Bianca Klein. Thank you, Danielle, for the warm welcome introduction and for inviting Dylan and I to present on behalf of the Innovative Leadership Network today. We greatly appreciate the opportunity and also want to thank everyone on the call as well. We know how busy the workday can get and appreciate your interest in time. If you can go ahead and advance, Dylan. So um, I just wanted to let you all know, Dylan is doing the driving today so that we don't have to share back and forth. So there may be a little bit of a delay. Um, I don't want to spend too much on this slide as uh, Danielle has already introduced us, but I do want to point out that Dylan's Twitter handle is there so that you can continue to stay in touch with him or reach out later if you have any questions. As Danielle mentioned, Dylan and I are two of seven core team members of the Innovative Leadership Network, and we are both passionate about the network and the mission to enhance the working culture of the National Park Service by fostering creativity, leadership development, communication and idea sharing, innovative action, and the empowerment of NPS employees at all levels. Before we get too far in the weeds about us, however, we want to learn a little bit more about you and your familiarity your familiarity with the National Park Service by taking a quick poll. So Danielle or Melinda, could you guys bring the poll out for us, please? Yep, it's going right now. Great. I can't see that, so just let me know how it's going. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the polling now. We have most people have responded. Okay. Let's see. Can so, you how many it? units of the National Park Service did most folks visit in 2016? Four plus. We had 40% for that response. Wow. Well, and that's then, great. Yeah. And then we had two to three um, had 26%. Um, one was 11%, and then 20% for none. And then we had a couple for next year. Okay. Well, great. Looking at the results, it's great to see that quite a few of you visited the National Park Service, a, a National Park Service unit during the centennial year. Next slide, Dylan. So to kick off the presentation, we wanted to begin by setting the stage with three big numbers for the National Park Service that all relate specifically to the formation of the Innovative Leadership Network. Those numbers are number one, 325 million and 15%. So number one, uh, this number is based on an annual survey conducted by the Pew Research Center. The Pew Survey on Government has been conducted since 1958 and focuses on the public perception of the U.S. government. Overall, the public's trust continues to decline with only 19% of those polled in 2015 saying they trust the government in Washington to do what's right. Despite this overall low ranking, also in 2015, 
the poll revealed that the National Park Service had the lowest favorability of all 305 agencies in the U.S. government and was ranked second in favorability over the U.S. Postal Service. So pretty good news there. Next slide, please. So what does 325 million have to do with the Park Service? Well, thanks to quite a view on the call, quite a few of you on the call and millions more, 2016 was a record-breaking year with over 325 million visits to national park units, up from 307 million in 2015. Compare this to popular attractions and events such as major sporting leagues and the Disney theme parks, it's clear that the national parks are well-loved and visitation supports the Pew Survey and favorability findings. Next slide. This last number, 15%, is the number that brings us all back to Earth. Despite the public perception and increasing visitation in our parks, in 2016, the National Park Service ranked 262 out of 304 in the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey in workplace satisfaction. Next slide. And unfortunately, workplace satisfaction has declined nearly every year since 2010 and is down significantly from a high in 2004. With those three numbers in mind, our presentation will cover the following four sections of which Dylan and I will be sharing back and forth. Um, like I said, please forgive us if there's a slight delay in advancing the slides as we are covering this from two different places. I will now turn the talking over to Dylan so that he can give us an overview of the why behind the, leadership, the Innovative Leadership Network mission. All right, thanks, Bianca, uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. So before we can talk about where we are and where we're going, uh, let's go back and let's quickly look at how we got to where we are today. So the story of our National Park Service traces its origin back to the original 13 United States. Now, having just won our War of Independence, uh, the young nation looked west. Now, one of the cultural drivers of the day was this Jeffersonian ideal of the yeoman farmer. And, and this idea persists today as the embodiment of American values, you know, honest, virtuous, hardworking, independent. And uh, one of the necessities uh, of this vision was land. So uh, let's just do a quick word association. Uh, you know, no need to type anything in, but just think to yourself, uh, what comes to your mind when you hear the word wilderness? Did you think of, you know, maybe a majestic snow-capped mountain, uh, lush forests with charismatic wildlife roaming around, or maybe, you know, a secluded personal experience hiking or, or camping? Um, today, wilderness represents, you know, the last remaining places where civilization is not fully enveloped to the earth. You know, it's an island in a sea of urban industrial modernity. Well, as the author William Cronin writes, you know, this was not always so. For centuries, the word wilderness really represented dark, unknown lands where ferocious beasts lurked. Uh, and many of these associations come from, you know, a religious text where the term is used over and over again to refer to places on the margins of civilization where it's all too easy to lose oneself in moral confusion and despair. So whatever value wilderness had you know, arose solely from the possibility that it might be reclaimed and civilized um, towards human ends. This value really held true throughout much of our early history. You know, the concept of manifest destiny influenced American policy throughout the 1800s. And it was really a driving force behind the rapid expansion of America into the West from the East, you know, quote, civilizing the land. But then something happened, you know, by the end of the 19th century, all this changed. Uh, in California in 1851, tensions between Native Americans and white settlers escalated into violence. And uh, in the midst of that conflict, settler James Savage led the Mariposa Battalion of soldiers uh, into Yosemite Valley in pursuit of the Awanichi tribe. And uh, accounts from this expedition recount grown men who, when first laying eyes upon the valley, fell to the floor and openly wept. You know, so, so these once worthless wildlands uh, you know, were, were quite suddenly seen as, as almost beyond price. You know, and starting with the Yosemite Grant, which Abraham Lincoln signed in the midst of the Civil War, uh, one by one, uh, these various corners of the American map came to be designated as sites where wild beauty was so spectacular that you know, a growing number of citizens just had to visit and see them uh, for themselves. And this was such an innovative idea, there was really no agency or structure in place to coordinate or to manage the parks. And our, you know, our national park system was such a radical idea when first proposed that it really took incredible dedication from 
steadfast champions, you know, who are really adept at forming networks of supporters, partnerships, and challenging the conventional norms to achieve what we enjoy today. And one of those radicals was Stephen Mather, who, according to popular folklore, when visiting Sequoia and Yosemite in 1914, was disgusted by what he saw the, as the poor condition of the parks. So legend has it he wrote a letter of complaint to his college classmate, uh, Secretary of the Interior, Franklin Lane, who reportedly wrote back, Dear Steve, if you don't like the way the parks are being run, why don't you come to Washington and run them yourself? Well, that's exactly what Mather did, and he began to mold a haphazard collection of parks into a cohesive system and uh, created a federal agency devoted to them, the National Park Service. And Mather really, he had no budget. Uh, he's even reported to have paid the salaries of his first staff members out of his own pocket. And in those early days, you know, the NPS was the very model of what we might today call a startup. Well, time passed and America changed in the 1960s. Uh, you know, it was really a time of social and cultural revolution, and the same was true within the parks. And, and many practices that had gone on for decades were finally reexamined. And for example, in Yellowstone, rangers had always fed the garbage generated within the parks uh, to the bears, uh, even erecting bleachers and signs uh, for crowds to gather and watch. So the 1960s saw the Park Service widely put a stop to this and, and other types of practices that were really not conducive to a, a park setting uh, for people or for wildlife. And in the same decade, a young President Kennedy gave a speech at Rice University. And most of you likely know this as, uh, as the, Kennedy's, the Kennedy's moonshot, his challenge to the United States to, to reach the moon by the end of the decade. Uh, but he started the speech that day with a quote that history doesn't remember quite so keenly. Um, and as a history major in college, one of the things I love about human history is that we can find you know, these, these prescient examples of previous generations wrestling with the same challenges and topics that, that we struggle with today. And one of the most fascinating issues is that of change. So in the half century since Kennedy's speech, you know, the change that he spoke of is not only accelerated, it's really gone into overdrive. And pick your metric and you can see how the last two decades, our measurements have basically gone vertical. You know, uh, stock market indices, world GDP, patent filings, CO2 levels in the atmosphere, and uh, Moore's Law. You know, they have these, they call these hockey stick charts because they're flat and then suddenly they, they curve up like the front of the stick. So, uh, you know, and as barriers to entry melt away, product cycles and time to market are getting shorter and shorter. It took 75 years for the telephone to reach 50 million users and Angry Birds only 35 days. And another significant change is urban population growth. So these are, uh, this is a picture, two pictures of Shanghai uh, from the same vantage point. So if I told you that the bottom picture represents the city pretty much as it looks today, uh, you might think the top photo is from the 1950s or the 60s, uh, but it was actually taken in 1990. So it's a pretty remarkable change in just 20 years. So considering you know, human adaptation to change, we had nearly a century to come to grips with the internal combustion engine before our roads were choked with cars, yet you know, despite that, um, I work in a park where wealthy benefactors constructed their own network of carriage roads because they didn't want their horses and carriages sharing roads with automobiles. And although this particular investment has, has been a boon to the public as a result of their philanthropy, you know, not all reactions to change are, are so positive. And another somewhat prescient quote from the past comes from Alexis de Tocqueville. And uh, this is a lot of text, so I apologize, but I thought it was really, uh, really pertinent to this conversation. But, you know, he, he recognized that uh, the danger that the threat rigidity hypothesis posed, uh, the effects of which, you know, I think we can, we can see around us today. Uh, for example, you know, our political institutions and systems were designed over 200 years ago and are really struggling to adapt to these rapid advances uh, in the form of driverless cars, Airbnb, Uber, and all of these disruptive forces. So these product cycles mean, you know, that even the patent application approval process can now actually take longer than the technology is viable. So there may soon come a point where government simply cannot adapt to these changes as fast as they occur. And this is, you know, what we call the law of disruption. And that is that technological change is exponential, whereas social business and political change is incremental. And the Park Service probably finds ourselves somewhere right down there towards the bottom. Which brings us to this really interesting graphical, although non-scientific, depiction of this idea. Um, in his new book, Thank You for Being Late, Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times columnist uh, Thomas Friedman offers this representation of where he feels we are uh, within this rapid evolution. 
So where does this leave us? Uh, you know, in short, uh, confused probably. So now that we're all thoroughly depressed and horrified, let's flip this around and let's look at the upside. Uh, one of the undeniable benefits of all this advancement is that technology gives us incredible opportunities to connect and, and allows us to leverage collective intelligence and passion expertise on a far grander scale than we ever could have imagined in the past. So the most rapidly evolving kinds of connections are those really enabled by the internet, cloud computing, and software apps, and the data it allows us to share. So these data and metrics can really help inform our approach uh, when addressing these complex um, adaptive challenges, and they allow us to simplify complex questions and focus our efforts on those areas where we can have the greatest positive effect. So the, the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey is this annual survey of employees that Bianca mentioned, um, measures our perceptions of whether conditions characterizing successful organizations are present in government agencies. In 2016, more than 400,000 employees participated in the survey. So it's tempting uh, to try to simplify these surveys and their results on, you know, on, on job satisfaction. For example, you know, we, we often equate money with happiness, but it really it frequently takes more than that to improve our workplace satisfaction. So if you were to compare every federal agency, you would find only a 30% correlation between your pay and your workplace satisfaction. But on the other hand, you would find a 90% correlation between your empowerment and your workplace satisfaction. And this makes sense when you consider theories of, of human motivation, such as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, our pay can take care of physiological needs, safety needs. Uh, it could be a sign of appreciation and belonging. And if you're rich, it may even be a sign of esteem. But what money can't do is fulfill your need for self-actualization, uh, that need to be creative and to innovate. So if we apply Maslow's theory to the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey rankings, we can take a look at a few agencies and, and see where they fall on these metrics. So the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, uh, ranks 242nd out of 304 agencies for pay, well within the bottom quartile of the rankings. Uh, yet they scored 28th out of 303 for empowerment, which correlates very closely with our perception of senior leadership. And they rank sixth overall out of 304 for best places to work. NASA, uh, proving again that pay isn't the most important factor. Uh, NASA is the top ranked agency in the EVS for five years running. And again, you know, we can see they rank 28 out of 304 for pay. And not bad, um, but they rank second in empowerment and perception of senior leadership. And they rank first overall out of 304 for best places to work. The National Park Service ranks only a few spots behind FERC for pay, uh, we're 274 versus their 242, uh, yet we rank far below them in empowerment, uh, which correlates again very closely with our perception of senior leadership. And we rank 262 out of 304 for the best places to work. So, so out of that data, Island has developed this model that we believe will help bring about cultural change within the agency and make the National Park Service a more satisfying workplace for our employees. And we believe that if we promote, in, promote innovation, it'll lead to increased empowerment uh, and improve our workplace satisfaction, leading ultimately to greater mission accomplishment. And we tested this theory by running a regression analysis of the 2015 Employee Viewpoint Survey. And in this regression, we found the number one factor in mission accomplishment score is workplace satisfaction with a 0 .309 correlation. And that means for every one point increase in our workplace satisfaction, we increase our mission accomplishment score by 0 0.309. And with workplace satisfaction being the number one factor in our perception of mission accomplishment, then we should next look at factors in workplace satisfaction. So it's interesting to find that mission accomplishment is by far the number one factor in workplace satisfaction, which if you think about it, makes a lot of sense. You know, if you're on a winning team, you're happy. And if you're happy, you're more likely to accomplish your mission. So it's, it's cyclical. Now, the number one factor for empowerment is innovation. And this is where ILN really gets its mission. Um, you know, based on the results of this regression analysis, the, uh, the NPS promotes innovation, will empower our employees and increase our mission accomplishment. And this is also where the benefit of diverse networks comes into play. You know, diversity of perspective provides support for inventing, trying out new solutions and leveraging different talents, knowledge and interest and creating conditions that are really conducive to innovation. So why does this all really matter? Well, most people think, uh, most people link engagement to performance. Um, you know, we've always thought that 
engagement leads to great work. But what if it's the other way around? So put another way, what if engagement actually comes from doing great work? So are your employees given the opportunity to do something great, something that allows them to contribute to something bigger than themselves? So the act of inviting your employees to become involved in great work could lead directly to engagement and empowerment. So ILN extends this invitation to our members and we work intentionally with senior leaders and partners within the agency hierarchy to create opportunities for our members. And, and if that's not enough, then uh, here are uh, some additional benefits of engagement as defined by Gallup in their 2013 employee engagement survey. So NASA is number one in workplace satisfaction, and this can be attributed to the fact that NASA is incredibly successful at empowering innovation among their employees. And uh, the roots of this can be traced back to the Apollo program kicked off by Kennedy. Uh, but before his speech and before the success of the lunar landings, a NASA employee had to step up to suggest a radical idea that contradicted his agency's thinking. Uh, John Hobo, believing that his agency was headed down the wrong path, took it upon himself to write a letter to Dr. Robert Siemens, the associated, uh, associate administrator of NASA. And he said, somewhat as a voice in the wilderness, I'd like to pass on a few thoughts on matters that have been of deep concern to me over recent months. Do we want to get to the moon or not? So NASA was convinced that the only realistic way to get to the moon was a direct path. Now, Hobo believed there was a better option, and in voicing his thoughts, he ultimately saved NASA years of effort and untold millions of dollars in cost to develop the huge Nova rocket that would have been required for a direct landing. So instead, thanks largely to Hobo's calculations, NASA was able to realize a lunar orbit rendezvous requiring a much smaller rocket. And as a result, NASA recognized that all employees' voices matter regardless of their rank, and they became more open to suggestions from employees and involved them in great work. And you know, just recently, additional stories of NASA's pioneering approach have come to light. As part of the final checklist for John Glenn's pioneering flight in 1962, uh, one of his checklist items was have the girl double check the numbers. Well, John Glenn got all the credit, but the girl who played a vital role in making it happen was Katherine Johnson, whom if you had not heard, uh, was finally recognized uh, by President Obama for her critical work with the Presidential Medal of Freedom in, in 2015. And that leads us uh, nicely into employee resource groups, which uh, Bianca is going to take over. Great. Thank you, Dylan. So you might be wondering, where does the ILN fit into the big National Park Service picture? To gauge knowledge and familiarity of our next topic, please take the next two polls. How many of you have heard of employee resource or affinity groups? And better yet, how many, are you, how many of you are currently a part of an employee resource group? I'm going to end the polling now for the first question and share the results. So for how many of you have heard of employee resource um, or affinity groups, we had 66% say no and then 34% say yes. So I'm going to stop sharing those results and then I'm going to launch the second question here and give it a couple of seconds. So how many of you are currently a part of an employee resource group? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and share the results. So we have 88% um, are not currently part of an employee resource group and then 13%, yes, they are. So about, yeah, there's pretty big <laughs> difference there. Certainly, well, thank you for the polls. Um, as many of you in the private sector know, the ERG model is not new. And in fact, some employee resource groups have been around since the 1960s where they began as race-based employee groups. A recent resurgence in popularity of ERGs has found the scope expanded to interest-based groups and was adopted by the National Park Service fairly recently with the goal stated in blue, kind of tiny on the slide, uh, to include to connect employees across the service who share a common interest, to increase retention by developing community and providing networking opportunities, to provide professional development opportunities to employees to improve their skills, and to advance the NPS mission by allowing employees to take initiative in creating solutions. This definition on the screen is taken straight from the catalyst.org website, and it says it all about employee resource groups. 
Additionally, the National Park Service ERGs are employee-led groups with members who are drawn together by a common interest and work toward advancing relevancy, diversity, and inclusion to meet the NPS mission. Next slide. As you can see here, the Innovative Leadership Network is one of seven chartered employee resource groups recognized by the National Park Service. These employee resource groups cover a wide range of interests and are composed of employees who share characteristics such as race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, age, or simply a desire to improve the working culture of the National Park Service, as is the case for the Innovative Leadership Network. This map gives you an idea of just how spread out and far-reaching our network is. We have members in almost every state in U.S. territory. And this map shows the continental U.S. in a little more detail. And after analyzing this map earlier this week, Dylan and I agreed that we have some recruiting work to do, as we can't yet say all 50 states, as apparent by no star in both Oregon and Wisconsin. Dylan will now take over to talk about the third section of our presentation on the dual operating system. All right, thanks, Bianca. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about systems here. And on that topic, um, here's a great quote by Gregory Bateson, who was particularly interested in systems theory. And we'll talk a bit about this concept as we discuss the, the dual operating system. So the critical factor in the Innovative Leadership Network's formation and success is really self-organized leadership. So those of us who founded ILN, as well as employees who hear about us, um, you know, voluntarily step forward and say, I'd like to be a part of this. And it's interesting to note when we think of um, you know, leadership that the etymology of the word lead actually derives from the old English Latin, which means to sprout forth. Uh, so it's highly appropriate for an agency like the National Park Service, which exists to preserve and protect some of our most treasured wilderness and natural areas, uh, really working in the realm of emergent thinking on network leadership. So the dual operating system. Um, this is a concept that was popularized by renowned Harvard Business School professor emeritus and leadership guru John Cotter. In his 2014 book, Accelerate, Cotter suggests that our organizations are no longer capable of keeping up in a rapidly moving world. So today, the majority of government agencies and global corporations operate under a system introduced in the 1800s. And this is probably familiar to all of us. It's a pyramid-shaped org chart with lots of employees at the bottom um, and fewer uh, managers as you move up towards the top. And this system works, works really well. It's efficient and excels at planning, uh, organizing, and solving technical problems. However, it can bog down when it's faced with complex systemic and, and adaptive challenges. So many organizational development scholars really point out the fact that standard managerial processes, even when they're minimally bureaucratic, are really are inherently risk averse and, and resistant to change. And part of this problem is political. You know, managers really are loath to take chances without permission from their superiors. And then another part of the problem is cultural, and that that is that people are are you know they cling to their habits and and fear loss of power and stature, which are two essential elements within hierarchies. And finally, part of the problem is that hierarchies themselves, you know, with their specialized units, rules, and processes really crave stability and default to doing what they already know how to do. And these characteristics are more pronounced when you pile one hierarchy on top of another to create a matrix organization such as the National Park Service. And the hierarchy is really based on Frederick Winslow Taylor's principles of scientific management. You know, the idea that every action can be broken down into component parts, measured, analyzed, and optimized to shave seconds off of its production time or cents off of its cost. And Taylor's methods, you know, they, they, there's no doubt they brought about incredible gains in efficiency and productivity. And so impressive were his results that by the late 1920s, all of modern society had really come under the sway of the single commanding idea. And efficiency and productivity were the gold standard and meant that anything that couldn't be measured must be inefficient and therefore wasteful. So it really was a zero-sum game. If it, you know, if it couldn't be measured, it was a waste. So contrary to the 20th century perception of organizations as these predictable machines, uh, many management thinkers have now come to view them as complex and evolving systems. Uh, you know, holacracies or teal organizations, et cetera. And for centuries, you know, we believe that natural ecosystems each reached a state of balance, you know, a pinnacle of evolution after which there'd be very little change. However, in the, in the latter half of the 20th century, scientists began to realize that ecosystems are in fact perpetually evolving. You know, ever-changing environmental conditions means external forces uh, constantly threaten species' existence by altering their living space. And to survive, organisms must constantly adapt to changing conditions. And the same is true of our corporations and our government agencies. 
So despite all this, making our agencies more effective, uh, it, it really needn't take the form of a radical new social order. In fact, we can successfully augment our current structures with networks, take advantage of the strengths of both and minimize their weaknesses. So when the, you know, when the adaptability and agility of a network are paired with efficiency and productivity of formal agency structures, um, you know, leaders can really capitalize and leverage the strengths of both. So five principles of the dual operating system. You know, to move faster, you need more people uh, involved in the strategic change effort, um, which means leveraging volunteers from the hierarchy to staff and network. And you can't mobilize volunteer energy unless people want to be change agents and, and feel they have permission to do so. The spirit of volunteerism, the desire to work with others, uh, really is what energizes the network. And people won't want to do a day job in the hierarchy and a night job in the network, which is basically what this is, uh, if you appeal only to the rational side. So you really need to speak to their emotions and their genuine desire to contribute to positive change. Now, to take an agency like the National Park Service in strategically smart ways into a better future. And the core of a hierarchy is competent management. And a strategy network, by contrast, needs lots of leadership. Uh, it's all about vision, opportunity, agility, and inspired action. And then finally, you know, the network and the hierarchy, they have to be inseparable with a constant flow of information and activity between them. And it's an approach that works because the volunteers in the network all work within the hierarchy as well. And most importantly, leaders in a network work to achieve their agency's goals in collaboration with the hierarchy and not in opposition to it. So how could this possibly work, right, <laughs> especially within government? Well, we already have examples where this has worked in one of the most siloed command and control organizations in government, and that is the U.S. military. So in his, in his fantastic book, Team of Teams, a retired General Stanley McChrystal recounts how U.S. Special Operations Forces successfully responded to the network threat of al-Qaeda in Iraq and countered the insurgency following the 2003 invasion. And he calls this evolution a move from a traditional command um, to a command of teams and then eventually to what he called a team of teams. So essentially to beat a network, uh, they had to become a network. Now we can see this work, um, you know, in, in partnerships as well. And Occupy Sandy is a great example. Uh, and, you know, in the wake of the hurricane, the Occupy movement is actually able to provide faster relief and aid than FEMA. And this is because they have such a wide distributed network already in place from Occupy Wall Street. You know, they were reach out to those on the periphery of their network and, and determine where the most dire needs existed. So FEMA and the Red Cross provided the supplies, but Occupy Sandy knew where they needed to go. So the, the key takeaway um, from all this with the dual system is that this is not a zero-sum game. It doesn't need to be all or nothing. Uh, we can do both. Um, and that, uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Bianca to talk a little bit about communications, which is a critical element of all this. Thank you, Dylan. This conceptual geographic network diagram was developed about a year ago, and it has been exciting to watch the ILN grow and the various teams listed here have fallen into place. The three major geographic tiers of membership include the core team, located in the center, which Dylan and I are a part of, the regional teams just outside of the core team area, and the area or park chapters located on the outer edge of the network. Next slide. Of the three tiers, I'm going to highlight the work of park chapters, as they are the boots on the ground for our organization and where the success stories can be found right now. Park chapters are starting to gain momentum as the concept of the mission of the ILN becomes more clear to the National Park Service as a whole. These are just a few of the fully operational park chapters with Lyndon B. Johnson celebrating their two year birthday earlier this week. Park chapters are forming at parks of all sizes from a small staff of a handful to a few dozen to a few hundred at parks like Rocky Mountain or Yellowstone National Park. ILN park chapters are not a one size fits all and are scalable to the unit workforce. As a member of both the core team and Yellowstone's park chapter, I've realized the importance of communicating, excuse me, communicating the successes of park chapters as those success stories and projects are the best way to demonstrate what the ILN can do for an NPS unit and overall what the ILN is working toward. A few project examples include park chapters as think tanks for park projects. As managers identify a need in a park, he or she can approach the ILN as a group to help accomplish that need. Other ILN chapters are spearheading efforts to improve morale by creating peer award committees and special events to thank and acknowledge employees doing great work at their unit. Yellowstone National Park recently conducted a seasonal employee survey 
To add to the employee viewpoint survey that Dylan discussed, as the employee viewpoint survey doesn't capture the views of the seasonal workforce. The results of this survey has helped the Yellowstone chapter to prioritize future projects in efforts to help the seasonal, temporary, and permanent workforce be more successful in dealing with the increased numbers of visitors to the park this coming year. Next slide, please. As the co-chair of the Communications Committee, my efforts focus on ensuring our network communications are clear, concise, and as frequent as appropriate. As a primarily virtual intra-organization, communication is critical. And we are thankful to have some advantages within the National Park Service framework already. We luckily have a common language, and as government SIFs, we thankfully know most of our own acronyms. We have similar organizational structure across units nationwide, with all of the parks being uh, more or less divided into branches, divisions, etc. And we make use of Google, the Google suite of products that are already very collaboration friendly. One of our committees, the Student Engagement Network, has an active Facebook page that's geared to provide communication for our student employee segment of the workforce. So we're trying to reach out to other uh, generational uh, groups as well through our communication means. And something new last year to the Park Service is the use of the Common Learning Portal, a National Park Service specific web, web, web platform, excuse me, where education and collaboration come together to provide an internal employee forum, which we are all just beginning to take full advantage of and are really enjoying the benefits of. The fact that our workforce is somewhat transient also helps us network as the NPS really is a small world and some of our members are on multiple employee resource groups and that helps us to connect even in increases our collaboration across the other NPS employee organizations even more. Like every virtual network, we certainly have our share of challenges as well. First and foremost, the Innovative Leadership Network is a collateral duty with no budget, which leads us to very creatively meet our needs. While the rule of seven in marketing may work for a business, this communication tactic doesn't work well for the ILN, as we've heard not another ILN email more than a time or two. We try our best to balance our messages and overall communication without filling up our members' inboxes. With little opportunity for valuable face-to-face -face time, we look forward to increasing the use of webinar software and potentially adding video to be able to put a voice and a face together with a name in the future. We also struggle with our membership growth and the challenges inherent with a transient workforce. One, our once small, intimate, all-network calls uh, grew over time, and with our current membership of 411 members, we outgrew most webinar platforms and conference call lines and uh, have lost the ability to engage in discussion with individual members through these calls. As I alluded to, our members are movers and shakers, so being able to keep up with those changes is a project we're currently trying to tackle, and we would be very open to ideas to send them our way as we're always looking for ways to grow, change, and adapt. Dylan will now take over to help us wrap things up. All right, thanks. Just got a couple slides here left and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, so the takeaway from all of this is um, that we're really trying to get across is change can be a good thing. You know, uh, we don't feed bears trash anymore. <laughs> and today there's really an increasing acceptance of networks, you know, using the diffusion of innovation model. Um, you know, we could probably predict the networks find themselves in the early adopter phase and sort of approaching the chasm that, that separates us from the tipping point. And ILN is in a similar spot. You know, we have supporters and advocates within the National Park Service leadership, but we're also raising some eyebrows and, and generating some questions as well, uh, which is to be expected. So we talked a lot about empowerment today. Uh, and one thing that, that we feel is really critical to note is that despite the, the best intentions, one cannot be empowered to make good choices without a proper context. And de Tocqueville recognized this when he looked at America's fledgling democracy in the 1800s. Uh, what's interesting is just last week during his confirmation hearing, our, uh, our nominee for Secretary of the Interior, Ryan Zinke, our boss, said he would ensure that the Department of the Interior employees working directly with the public were empowered to give a voice to those with whom they worked. Those employees at the ground level should have the flexibility to make decisions, he said. Now, this is a noble goal, but, you know, the only, only if such empowerment comes with um, clarity and context. You know, without a clear understanding of the facts and a holistic contextual awareness, you know, people may not make the best decisions. Uh, for example, the 2008 financial crisis came about in part by young uninformed financial professionals being given far too much leeway and far too little guidance. So this is really a, a critical caveat. 
A political structure in which decision making is decentralized requires a high level of awareness. So if people are not educated enough to make informed decisions, the system doesn't work. So that's a critical element of what Island is trying to do as well. Now, Wayne Gretzky said that what made him a great hockey player was that he skated to where the puck would be and not to where it was. And as we look at the hockey stick shaped graphs charting the exponential pace of change in our world, this is more appropriate now than ever. Um, you know, it'll take collective action, pioneering spirit to take us to where we need to be in the future and not where we have been in the past. So here's our final thought. You know, networks are the future. Uh, human connection is the way we adapt and we build resilience. You know, we can use technology to our advantage. Um, the engineers predict that within the decade, every single human being on the planet will be connected via a supercomputer in their pocket. So just as an, you know, just as an ecosystem, we need to find ways to flex and adapt to the circumstances around us instead of rigidly resisting them. So the more diversity of perspective we can incorporate, the greater our options for discovering and leveraging creative, innovative solutions to complex and systemic challenges. And just last week, I received an email from my former boss uh, who echoed this thought. Uh, you know, when the arc of progress seems slow, remember, America is not the project of any one person. The single most powerful word in our democracy is the word we. We the people, we shall overcome, yes we can. So we'd like to really thank UC Denver for inviting us to join you today and thank you to each of you for all your work on the vital topic of networks. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to us at any time and, and right now we, you know, we'd love to take some of your questions and, and have a dialogue. Well, Bianca and Dylan, Thank you so much for just an outstanding presentation. Um, I actually had so many thoughts and questions of my own there. I want to make sure everyone remembers to put any questions that you have at this time in the Q&A box. Um, but yeah, that was by far one of the um, my most favorite webinars I've ever seen on um, network leadership. And so <laughs> thank you very much for that. Um, there are a few questions. Um, so let me let me go ahead and 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 ask those um, and you all can share um, responding. Um, when one person asked a, a question, she says, I have many friends who've worked for uh, the concessions in Yellowstone. She wonders if the these people are included in the network. Um, she says their work can make or break a visitor's experience and may have been in the park for 30 years with that. She would think that experience would be worthwhile. So, um, and I think expanding on that question, you, uh, you know, what kinds of range of positions do you have included in the network? You know, that's a really great question and something we haven't come across before. I would say um, concessioners are integral really to having a great visitor experience. So. Um, we would definitely be open to entertaining anybody that would be interested in joining us, especially if they have um, interest in some of the initiatives that we have and some of the projects we're working on. We're always looking for, um, pers for you know, perspectives from everyone at the table. So um, you definitely have that person get in contact with us. That would be great. Thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, so another way, another person asks, what about distributed leadership concepts? Do you consider leadership as distributed? Um, I don't we know if need yeah, um, we definitely do. Um, that's one of the things that we are continually trying to advocate to our members is that idea that that anyone in the network can be a leader. Um, you know, it's not dependent upon your title or your pay grade or your your length of service or anything like that. You know, leadership is a choice. Um, really, and that's uh, and that's one of the things that ILN really tries to tries to uh, push. Um, I think you know you see a lot of resistance to that. And I think particularly in, in bureaucratic institutions where we're so rigidly defined in terms of what we can and we we can't do. Um, so we're definitely trying to encourage all of our members, um, you know, from from the newest to the longest running, and uh, you know, regardless of the demographics, that you know, if you have an idea for change or for innovation, uh, just like NASA, you know step up raise your hand and say hey what about this and uh and that's exercising leadership and we you know we absolutely encourage that terrific so this is a current events question okay <laughs> so mm -hmm. um do you see any connection between the internal work done to strengthen networks and empower national park workers and workers ability to organize and respond to the current political crisis in the country Hmm. <laughs> um, 
it's okay he, to give he, a pass. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, we in in you know, the short answer is yes, um, absolutely, because you know networks overall are all about empowering people to step up and exercise leadership. And and I was, you know, we we need to be careful on that. You know, we are federal employees so you know we're constrained by law as far as what we can and can't do to advocate so you know, we can't take positions on, on certain political issues but um but you know speaking broadly uh, people participating in democracy is an inherently empowering and, and engaging thing to do so um i i personally certainly see see the the correlation there and i don't know bianca if you if you have anything to add no i don't that was a great response dylan yeah I, th I think also um, I appreciate your the question and also your response and it makes me think of a question that gets asked quite a bit in networks um, which is how being a part of a network increases capacity of people or organizations that are part of it and I think that is a, a common question and, and we hope that a common um, growing lesson that we're learning is that being parts of a part of a network is building capacity at an individual organizational level at the same time and so um, it would make sense to to think it might do the same um, across networks. Yeah, um, right. Another question um, someone asked is, 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 do you measure networks? Do you measure your networks? Um, mm. We, you know, we're in the early stages of, of those types of diagnostics. And I know that, um, I know that several of our members who, who went to the, the NLTA, the Network Leadership Training Academy last year, you know, at UC Denver, um, were introduced to, to the partner tool and, and some of these other methods for, for measuring our networks. And we, we've done some early draft work with that, but we really, we haven't done enough. And that's actually something that's on our radar that, that you know, we, we need to get more of those measurements um, to really make us even more effective, to, to learn where those, where those connections are. Because um, right now, you know, we, we have our, our memberships and, you know, and spreadsheets and such, but we really can't see who's connected to who, which is a critical element. So, um, so that's definitely something that, that, is, that we're going to need to address in the near future. And, you know, even a, another follow-up on that, I, I remember talking to some folks last year about how to, how to use some of our, the kinds of um, tools like partner or methods, social network analysis to measure networks. Um, people were, some of the, the folks from the National Park Service were asking, and it, it was real clear that what you all have created is, is more of a system instead of a bounded network, which always makes the measurement of it a little more complicated. And so um, I know that folks were thinking about that then, and um, yeah, it was presenting a, a lot of challenges in, in measurement. Um, but along those lines, there's a kind of a follow-up question from someone else um, that starts with, thanks for your great work and presentation. Um, and then the, the the question that follows was is really about the extent to which um, it's important for communication with existing senior leadership leadership um, about methods of change or these specific tools to have data to 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 show and prove um, that these processes are things that the organization should adopt. So the question actually is, do we need data to convince leadership to try particular new approaches? Hmm. Um. Yeah, my initial reaction is yes, um, and and that I think you know I was I think we were trying to address that a little bit. We were talking about like Frederick Winslow Taylor and that idea of scientific management, and and that is that idea of efficiency and productivity is so ingrained um, in our government, and rightfully so because we need to be responsible with our with our tax dollars. Um, but uh, yeah, I think senior leaders want to see numbers. You know, they want to know that they're getting return on investment um, results, things like that. So I do think that. Um, it is critically important. You know, the Frederick Winslow Taylor's idea was if it couldn't be measured, it was inefficient. And and personally, I don't necessarily believe that that's true. But um, I think within the within the bounds of the organizational structure, I think that's still uh, an important uh, topic to address. Yeah. Um, this is a, a another question. So as the ILN grows and gains visibility within the National Park Service, it may well become integrated into the hierarchy. How do you maintain the grassroots startup feel that many IN, ILNers <laughs> might thrive mm. off of now? Mm. Bianca, do you want to? I've been monopolizing <laughs> your time here. Do you want to take no, that one? Um, that's a tough one. Um, I hope that it does continue to have the grassroots uh, effort feel to it. Um, what do you think, Dylan? 
Yeah, you know, I, that's something that we haven't we haven't yet reached that um, we haven't yet reached that point. Um, you know, this is still very grassroots, and, and I can definitely relate to the question because one of the things you see when startups, you know, gain uh, momentum, they have to hire more people, and and that's one of the one of the elements that John Cotter highlights is that you know you start with that agile startup, and then you know it calcifies over time, and you add more and more layers and supervision and processes and policies. Um, so that's going to be a challenge, to, and, and we haven't we haven't got there yet. Um, but it's a very valid question. I'm not sure how we're going to address that when and if we reach that point. Great. I have a feeling you're going to be able to do it. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> okay. A couple a couple more questions. We have a few more minutes here. Um, you talked about a survey of satisfaction and engagement. Do you have any measurements following program implementation? So a little bit of the same data question. Um, in reference to survey you mentioned? Yeah, um, I mean, I can take that on a broad level and then Bianca, I'm sure, can talk about Yellowstone because they're working on surveys there. Um, so broadly across the agency, the short answer is no. Um, ILN has really just, you know, we're about, we celebrate our two-year birthday on Martin Luther King Day just uh, last week or the week before. So we're still very, very young. Um, and culture change, which is what we're trying to do, and, and that's what this is, is really, a, it's a process. You know, it's going to take a long time to ingr you know, to change these deeply ingrained um, ideas uh, that are really part of our whole historic and traditional nature of, of the Park Service. So we don't really have any data yet to prove that we're going in the right direction. That actually is a great idea, though. Um, for us to maybe focus on internally in the future, because the EVS is, is across all government agencies. So I don't know that that's necessarily going to reflect specifically what ILN is accomplishing. I think where you'll see it is at the park, park level. And Bianca has been working on that at Yellowstone, so she could probably speak to that. Certainly, I, I mentioned it briefly in the presentation, um, but Yellowstone National Park recently conducted um, a seasonal workforce survey so that um, when folks who are seasonal and seasonals typically have a season anywhere from a couple of months um, to about four months to six months, um, sort of depending on um, what kind of position they hold, um, we wanted to get a basically real-time snapshot of what people were experiencing before they left the National Park Service, um, before they went off to do either another seasonal job or go back to school. So we tried to get a seasonal survey out at the end of uh, the summer to kind of gauge how the summer was for everyone. And basically, uh, the results for that are, uh, I think, sort of in development now. We're getting to the point where we've already uh, spoke to our management team about some of the results um, of that survey. And some of the things that sort of rose to the top were, um, you know, the housing um, for the park was not, you know, sort of what the expectations, uh, they did, it didn't meet expectations of some of these seasonal employees. Um, you know, just the amount of uh, visitors that we had, it definitely uh, caused a lot of uh, stress and um, quality of life issues that were not expected. And so a lot of those things that we were able to tease out of that survey, we're now going to put toward projects and implementing um, things that would help to improve the seasonal workforce's experience uh, next year, or actually this year, in 2017. So we are actually using some of that real-time data that we received from that survey in order to make implement, you know, implement projects that would make things better for our workforce next year. So that's how we're using it right um, at Yellowstone currently. Nice. So we just have um, this one last minute, and, and I'd like to ask you all a question. Um, how did you become so smart about networks? And I mean, listening to your presentation, I, I feel like you could be leading so many of these initiatives um, with with the background that you gave, um, in, initiative meaning learning about networks. Um, how did you all get to this point where you have such high capacity um, to know and lead networks? I'm, it's very impressive. That's a question for Dylan. <laughs> no, no. He did a great job. <laughs> Um, it's a it's a team effort, Bianca. Um, you, you know, and that's that's the thing. It's it's not any one of us uh, that's responsible for that. It's really it's all of us. Um, one of our one of our former members, Will Pope, um, was a whiz with statistics. So he did a lot of our EVS stats. You know, really crunching the numbers. Um, 
others of us are, are really passionate about um, you know you know c- c- certain topics or certain fields. Um, so it's really leveraging that diversity of perspective. Um, you know, everybody brings a little something different to the table, and as a result, everyone benefits. Um, so it's really collective intelligence and and diffusion of of, of all of that different diversity of perspectives, and that's what we're really striving for. Um, you know, beyond that, I just say that it's, it's empowerment, really, you know, it's, it's claiming empowerment individually, you know, those of us who are passionate about the park service and really want to make a difference, uh, choose to invest our time in, in learning more about this and really trying to push for this change in a way that's, you know, collaborative with the agency structure and not in conflict with it. Well, thank you. Um, I think that what you just said is, is so important because, um, we are all trying to figure out the best way to lead and be members of networks. And I think you just gave a nice testimony for what really works, um, the model we should be following. So um, there are numerous comments that say you all just did a terrific job. Um, Keep up the good work. Um, Thank you for the presentation. A question about resources. Um, We will post those and and work with um, Bianca and Dylan as well to to find other resources they may suggest. And Melinda will send out an email um, for this uh, with all of that at at the end. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and and end. And I cannot thank you you both enough. That was just, um, I said, one of my favorite presentations I've ever sat through. And I I have a feeling I'm speaking for a lot of folks on the phone. Um, Thank you. So we'll go ahead. Thank you. And they're great. Okay. Thank you both very much. Um, And thank you to everyone on the phone who attended. We hope that you'll continue to be part of our community and and join in these kinds of discussions and presentations. So we look forward to staying connected. Goodbye.